Okay, good morning. All right, well, thanks for coming. I think we have a quorum. So my pleasure this morning to introduce Todd Warner, who is going to talk to us about how he uses literature to make meaningful connections with his patients. So many of you know Todd. He's a graduate of North Dakota State uh, for college, University of Minnesota for med school. He did his uh, uh, internal medicine residency and chief residency here at Abbott. And he's been in practice with the ANGMA group, which is our probably one of the closest alliances with, we have with primary care group. And he's at West Health and in Edina. And uh, although I know from asking him repeatedly, he's full, so cannot uh, accept any new patients at this point. But uh, along with Mike Cummings, he's crafted an outpatient curriculum for the medical students and the residents, which uh, combines clinical experience with this liberal arts uh, tradition emphasis on heuristics and common sense in the first and in the first year of this curriculum he got the primary care preceptor the award uh, by the University of Minnesota med students just really one of numerous awards he's won over the last couple of years he lectures and uh, writes a lot of essays uh, on historical and literary topics he's currently ser serving also as a professor at st. John's University teaching class the art of healing a practical and benedictine approach to caring for others so my pleasure to welcome Todd. Thank you. Uh, can, you can you all hear me? I just turned this thing on. OK? All right. Uh, it's nice to see you all. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, it's, it's great to, first of all, it's April Fool's Day, so I want to reassure you, this is actually a talk on, on Shakespeare. So let me sit down. Um, it's nice to see uh, mentors. It's nice to see colleagues, uh, former residents of mine, um, coming here this morning. So thank you so much for being here. Um, let's just get started. So I, I, I want to, before I start, I want to say this. Um, one of the things I know, I've known about working uh, with clinicians at Abbott, when I'm working with MHI, uh, working with all the specialists, when I was going through training and since that time, is that we have incredible thinkers. We have inc incredibly adept people technically at doing the work of, of practicing medicine. But one of the things that is always there as well is that people care. They really do care. People stay late, they come early, they do extra reading, they make extra calls. And I will say my experience with MHI, when I call and have a question about an echo, an angiogram or what have you, the person on the other line is excessively busy. But they stop and they take the time and they do the extra work because they know there's someone at the other end of this at the other end of the phone, but also there's a patient involved that they want to do the best by because that's the calling of medicine. And I think one of the things we found in in our practice of internal medicine and teaching residents at Abbott and what we see coming out of the university is we've got to be very careful that the two things that aren't lost in medical education are number one is common sense and number two is the notion of vocation, of the calling of medicine and what, and, and what is at risk if we lose either one of those. So this is a little bit of a vocational, a vocational talk, um, but it's an invitation to people to, to re-explore the literature they left behind in high school, the literature they left behind in college um, the literature of Dostoevsky and Jane Austen and Charles Dickens and Shakespeare and Dante. And why? Because those people stick around simply because they speak about universal things. They speak about that which is deeply human. And so without further ado, let's talk about what can William Shakespeare teach us about the practice of medicine. So to capably practice medicine, what do we need? Well, we need a fundamental vocabulary in science. We need the skills to gather history and perform a physical exam. The capacity to think critically, a decisiveness to recommend a diagnostic and treatment plan, and an aptitude to operate efficiently and communicate precisely. Those are some of the fundamental things we need to practice medicine from. But it also does require a fundamental understanding of human nature and a willingness to care. And if we're not careful, this can be jettisoned pretty fast in our high-paced, hyper-efficient lives. So somehow, someone believed that a year of intense training and organic chemistry would better qualify us to be doctors. We all remember this situation. <laughs> OK. We may memorize the facts. We may, we may pass the test. We may be very smart. But without an understanding of human nature, we are not wise. I see a lot to the medical students and the residents. Smart is entry level in medicine. You made it. You passed the test. You're there. You're intelligent. That's not what you should aspire to. You should aspire to wisdom. And wisdom requires experience. 
one of William Osler's. Osler was, as you guys all know, the godfather of internal medicine, put Johns Hopkins on the map. One of his greatest gifts, many people don't know, was his keen sense of human nature. He recognized the profound value of seeing what motivated people as well as what plagued them. But how did he become so adept at this? First of all, he saw lots of patients. He read the medical literature, there's no question, but he said, you have to do your reps. You have to see patients one day at a time, one after the other, to get experience. The second thing is he gave a damn about them. You can't just be machine-like and, and looking at the numbers and looking at the charts and forget about the person sitting behind them. Which, what, what Osler said is, the good, doctor cares, uh, the good doctor treats the disease, the great doctor treats the patient who has the disease. But the other thing he did that many don't know is he read great literature, which further delved into the depths of human nature. Every night at 10 o'clock after long days, he put everything else away, and he'd crack open Shakespeare. He'd crack open Dante, crack open Thomas Brown, and read and learned so much about human nature that was encapsulated in those works. And in learning better about human nature as, as encapsulated in literature, he tried to better understand himself. But to do this requires humility, it requires patience, it requires experience. It also requires a willingness to learn that which is almost unteachable. Holzer said, start at once a bedside library and spend the last half hour of the day in communion with the saints of humanity. Who do you start with? Well, you know the name of the talk, so you know who I'm going to advocate, this guy. Now, we, now, one of the things I find that when you're, when you're a physician and you want to read, you're supposed to read things outside of, your, outside of your purview, you're supposed to only care about the medical aspects of it. Or if you want to volunteer in something, everybody wants you to take blood pressures or, or you know, check people's feet and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes you want to step away from that. So, so Shakespeare does a great job of talking about medical maladies alone. So, for instance, in Julius Caesar, Cassius is critical of the godlike Julius Caesar, talking about how Julius Caesar, he once saw him have an epileptic fit. And Cassius said, when the fit was on him, I did mark how he did shake. It is true, this God did shake. Remember, Caesar was conceived to be a god. He became helpless, probably incontinent. His coward lips did from their color fly. The, the color flew from his lips, he became very white as he gritted his teeth and shook. This same eye whose bend doth awe the world. He looks at you and he furrows his brow, you're in big trouble. He looks at you and raises his eyebrow, you might have a future. That same eye did lose his luster. I did hear him grow. Or we could talk about Falstaff describing his friend Bardal. Falstaff, if you're familiar with him, he was the corpulent, uh, 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 ne'er-do-well, troublemaker, drinker, swiller, conniver, who was in uh, Richard II, the Merry Wives of Windsor, Henry IV, Part One, Two, Henry V. And he's describing his friend Bardolph, who has raging rosacea and a, and a rhinophyma. And he says of Bardolph's nose, oh, thou art a perpetual triumph, an everlasting bonfire light. Thou hast saved me a thousand marks and links and torches, walking with thee in the night betwixt tavern and tavern. I don't need to buy torches because your nose lights the way, Bartolf. <laughs> or King Lear. King Lear, and we'll talk about him in this very same excerpt in a minute, but King Lear, in the mid lost half-naked in a storm-racked heather, and the bottom line is he's confused, and some of, some of his cognitive impairment, a little bit of dementia, is starting to bear itself as he, as he comes across his daughter, and he says, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He thinks I should know you and know this man. Yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. And all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me. Because you know the humiliation of people who feel their memory is failing. You know how much they cover. And King Lear is running into this. He was a king. But even more than those medical descriptions, William Shakespeare had an uncanny ability to capture the essence of human nature in his plays characters. In tragedy, in comedy, in history, his figures came to life. You know why? Because they simply seemed like us. In one figure, the person was smart but also foolish, brave and cowardly, innocent and guilty, generous and selfish. The heroes were heroic and not too heroic. They were a little flawed, and the villains were villainous, but they had a little sympathetic aspect in them, except for Iago. If you ever read Othello, there's absolutely nothing redeemable about Iago. Now, Shakespeare's characters were everyday figures from different walks of life, and they were comprised of shades of light and dark. Now, if you're familiar with Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was uh, the famous Russian dissident, put in a gulag for writing critical, critical comment in a letter about Stalin. And he spent all this time in eastern Siberia, years in the gulag, suffering through it, and having this work called the Gulag Archipelago um, spirited out of the camps 
but he learned lessons about human nature even in this hellish environment. And he said the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains an unuprooted small corner of evil. This is the stuff Shakespeare got. You can have a kid, your child, read them a story, and if the hero is too perfect or the villain is too bad, once they emerge from their early toddler stage, they cock their eyebrow and say, that doesn't seem super realistic. And Shakespeare put his finger on that mixed aspect that each one of us carry. G.K. Chesterton, another extraordinary thinker, said, it is the business of art, and I would say of literature, to seize these nameless points of greatness and littleness. The truth is that art has to single out sins that are not to be found in any decalogue, subtleties that transcend just the Ten Commandments, deep, deep subtleties. And art also has to single out virtues that cannot be named in any allegory. The subtle acts of heroism we walk by every single day, encapsulated in the subtleties of Shakespeare and other great artists and writers. Does one need to be a Shakespeare scholar to appreciate his wisdom regarding human nature? Yes, let's all go. No, hardly. Chesterton, again, a great thinker, he, he just finished reading a scholar's work on Shakespeare, which was very good and very insightful and very nuanced. And, and Chesterton, while appreciating it, commented kind of in a wry fashion, I hasten to say that the scholar is very learned. I'm very ignorant. I do not profess to know much about Shakespeare outside such superfluous trifling as the reading of his literary works. The point being that most of us, and there's a, there's a great essay by a, by a professor of Russian literature at Northwestern named Gary Saul Morrison. He says, why college kids are avoiding the study of literature? And he says, here's why. It's politicized, it, and it's deemed irrelevant, and it's done under pressure when you have to read it, and you have to write an, write an essay or write a test, doing a guess what I'm thinking approach to their teacher. And so guess what? People, people read this stuff in high school, they read this stuff in college, and they hate it. And they never go back to it again. But I always say to the students, did you read Hamlet in ninth grade like I did? Oh, yeah, I did. I said, yep, you know what that means? You never read Hamlet. I went and saw the Guthrie. I never even knew what I was watching. But reapproaching it within the last couple of years, I'm stunned. I'm stunned at how brilliant it is, in part because I'm doing it on my own. But the second thing is because I'm a different person now, way more experiences. When you read something later in life that you approached as a child, you might have gotten something out of it as a child, but there's something deep to the experiences that makes this come alive again. Session says, esthetes, those who are expert in beauty, your docent at, at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, who does great work, who knows all but the nuances of the paintings and the, the oils that were used and the influences and the era it came out of. But esthetes have goaded and jaded their artistic feelings too much to enjoy anything simply beautiful. The definition of an esthete is a man whose experience enough to admire a good picture, but not inexperienced enough to see it. What I mean by that and what Chesterton means by that is that docent has so much to convey to people who are there to listen. But if the docent walks away and you bring your five-year-old daughter up and tell her to look at the picture and tell you what she sees, she'll tell you things that you all missed. There's an innocence in seeing this as well. So when we read Shakespeare's works, and I mean really pay attention, what do we see? In essence, we see that Shakespeare's characters are complicated, extraordinary, frustrating, inspiring beings of great consistency, but also of great contradiction, very much like our patients, and in fact, quite a lot like ourselves. Samuel Johnson, the great British essayist, said, Shakespeare opens a mine which contains gold and diamonds in unexhaustible plenty, but it's clouded by incrustations, debased by impurities, mingled with a mass of meaner minerals. Goethe said, they call him the German Shakespeare, the highest achievement possible to a man, and a woman I would add, is the full consciousness of his own feelings and thoughts. For this gives him the means of knowing intimately the hearts of others. But we've got to remember that to understand Shakespeare, you must feel to truly tap into the deeply human and not simply think. We're, it's hard for us because we're analytical. But sometimes you've got to step back and tap into the emotion of what's being written. Too often we are convinced that we can reduce human nature into some predictable formula. We see what's, who's coming in, what they're complaining of, and we've already formulated our mind 
what's going on before we even enter the room half the time. The bottom line is, in our modern scientific age, we are capably of fully, we, we think that we are, we are capably of skill fully divining why people do what they do. In fact, if you wake up in the mirror and look, look at yourself, you can, you've been with yourself all your life, obviously. You can't fully explain why you do what you do. And yet, in 15 minutes of boiling this person down, we know all about their angles, where they're coming from, and so on. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use the cues and understand behaviors and so on and move on and stay efficient, but we should enter with a little bit of humility that we may not know it all. The impact of education isn't always good either. Like I said, sometimes people are forced at Shakespeare, do a guess what I'm thinking type of exercise and people move on. John J. Chapman said, many a lad at one point has known less about Shakespeare after education than he did when the only phrase he knew was anoint the witch. And he didn't even know where that came from. Now that he's educated about Shakespeare and literature, he can write the etymology, the word origin, on an examination paper, but the witch herself has vanished. Information is the enemy of poetry. T.S. Eliot, one of his great works, once said, where is the knowledge lost in information? Where is the wisdom lost in knowledge? We have our phones at our sides, access to everything, which doesn't mean it converts into understanding that's in our brains. And we have knowledge in our brains that doesn't mean it's been converted to wise application of that knowledge. We don't aspire just to have access to information or just knowledge, but a wise application of that knowledge. If we arrogantly consider ourselves masters at interpreting the way others think and act, we'll find ourselves wrong and our patients will be frustrated time and again. But if we humbly accept the limited understanding of the mysteries of human nature, we will open ourselves to a fuller experience with our patients and ourselves. And I would argue that Shakespeare's characters explore those mysteries in deep splendor and deep complexity. Chesterton says that we have a poet and a logician in us, every one of us do. They're constantly vying for, for power. Says poetry is sane because it floats easily in an infinite sea. But reason, the tool of logic, seeks to cross the infinite sea and so make it finite. The result can be mental exhaustion. To accept everything as an exercise, to understand everything, a strain. The poet only desires exaltation and expansion, a world to stretch himself in. The poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and it is his head that splits. Sometimes we've got to step back. We've got to take all that we understand, all we know, and, and that's wonderful. But we have to step back with humility and take a look at the wonder of what's, what we're doing the patient presents before us, what's the, what's the story of their life? And with humility approach them, um, understanding that they're deeply, deeply complex. As Ludwig Wittgenstein once said, don't think, but look. In taking snatches of time to warm ourselves to the fires of life that are found in Shakespeare's work, we will be reminded of the human and the transcendent in our daily practice. If we appreciate the varied hues in Shakespeare's characters, we'll better see the diverse hues within the patient seated before us in the exam room. So perhaps a little bit of time with the bard can teach us an even more about our very human patients, I would argue even more than organic chemistry. And while we are at it, perhaps it can teach us about ourselves. So next I'm going to have some snatches, some excerpts from some of Shakespeare's greatest works. I will define a few things along the way because I know I'd be looking at the definition of some of these words while I would go. So from as you like it, talk about Talk about the story of a life. Jacques is out in the woods. He's lamenting. He's thinking about the brevity of life and what is involved in life. And he says, all the world's a stage. All the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. Don't be daunted by this long slide, OK? But his act being seven ages. At first, the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face. Why is his morning face shining? Because mom and dad scrubbed it so hard before he goes off to school. Creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. We all watch Animal Kingdom at one point or some Discovery Channel thing. The slowest creature in all of, even all of captivity or outside of captivity, is a child who has to get out of bed and go to school in the morning. Creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover sighing like a furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Why to his mistress's eyebrow? Because if his mistress's eyebrow is listening to his ballad, his song, and it's like this, that's not a good sign. But if it's like this, that's a wonderful sign. Then a soldier full of strange oaths, 
bearded like the pard, that's a leopard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation. Think about reputation like a bubble, how easily it can pop. But he's seeking bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth, going willingly to death for this thing that is so fragile. And then the justice, in fair round belly, with good capon lines, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and flippered pantaloon, spectacles on nose, pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank. He's shrinking down, he's smaller, his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, becoming higher as he grows older. It pipes and whistles in his sound. The last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness, a mere oblivion, without teeth, without eyes, without taste, not everything. I just add a little takeaway with each one of these. Don't miss the unfolding drama <clears throat> of the patient sitting before you. Our patients like us are living lives with hints of tragedy mixed with heroism. If you pay attention, you'll see. I'll remember this one. This story that we talk about, two lovers, star-crossed lovers, both nearly end up dead, and we have our high school kids read this one. <laughs> I always wonder at that sometimes. Romeo comes across Juliet. Juliet is not dead, but he thinks she's dead. And she is bereft of hope. Ah, dear Juliet, I still will stay with thee. And never from this place of dim night depart again. I will lie here with you in this rotting tomb. Because it's the only place I'll find happiness. Here will I remain with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here will I set up my everlasting rest and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars. The yoke that you put over the neck of the oxen to pull the plow, he is yoked with inauspicious stars, unfortunate stars that would tell his future good or bad. I will shake that off from this world buried flesh. You'll never begin to understand someone unless you allow yourself to ache just a little bit when they ache. The rule, I talk to the medical students and the residents and I say, listen, I understand the whole notion of being intellectual, having a distance, having equanimity in your care of patients. I so say one of the best rules I can give to you about that you should always follow, don't date your patients. Just never date your patients. It's a good idea not to date your patients, and you can't, nor should you. But the long and the short is we shouldn't intellectualize so much, have such remove, that when that patient we've seen for 20 years gets a terminal illness, when, uh, when, when this person out here uh, uh, is an alcoholic and they fell off the way, that you've worked so hard with and you know what, how dis disappointed they are in themselves, that you, if you don't ache a little bit when they ache, how much of a healer are we? You can't be a puddle, but the bottom line is we should care. As you know in Hamlet, the story of Hamlet, um, really quickly, as you might know, uh, king and queen of Denmark, Hamlet's the prince. The king gets killed. The king's brother moves in and gets married. And the king's brother killed, killed the king. And there's Hamlet watching his mother. His father just died. His father, he finds out, was killed by the uncle, and his uncle is his new stepfather. It's a very, very uh, complicated family. So the long and the short is that Horatio, so, so Hamlet finds out about his father's demise at the hands of his new stepfather from, ha from Hamlet's own father as a ghost. And he's, and he's relaying the story of what this ghost has said to him. And Horatio, the well-educated, the enlightened, and so on, is kind of telling Hamlet, well, let's really be rational about all this. And Hamlet cuts him short. And he says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your philosophy. Hershey, you don't understand it all. You can't explain it all. But you don't know it all. I would say that if we could, 85% of life's woes are, are attending, are, have to do with the fact that we have uncertainty and imperfection. If we can get rid of uncertainty and imperfection, the majority of our life would be good. The problem is, that stuff is, is not going away anytime soon. So we have to be humble about that. We need to recognize it's always going to be there. We can either struggle against it or we can cope with it. King Lear is the greatest of all tragedies, I think, anywhere. It's a tragedy. But here's the story really briefly about King Lear. King, king Lear in, in 60 to 7, uh, 90 seconds. King Lear is an old king, and he had three daughters, Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia. And King Lear wants to step away from the throne and divest his kingdom into thirds to his three daughters. But in order to do that, he wants the three daughters to come before the entire court and effectively profess their undying devotion and love to him. And it's really a spectacle to make your grown daughters do this. 
And so there King Lear is, and he says to Goneril, go ahead, Goneril. And she says before the entire court, I love you, Father. You can imagine how much I love you. There's no, no one can love you more. I'll do everything for you. I will honor you. Here you go, Goneril. Here's a third of the kingdom. Reagan. Reagan says, oh, Goneril is nothing on me. My love for you is so great. I love you more than my husband. I will, I will do everything for you imaginable. I will always honor you. I'm so devoted to you. There you go, Reagan. Here's a third of your kingdom. And he says to Cordelia, Cordelia, how about you? And she's his favorite. She's the youngest. And Cordelia says, nothing. And he looks at her and he says, have you nothing to say? She says, no, Father. He says, well, nothing will become of nothing. You'll get none of your inheritance. And ultimately, she says, Father, I, I love you what, I, what is due. But effectively, this is, this is disingenuous. They're doing this. She doesn't say this, but this is disingenuous. They're doing this to get from you what, what you have. I love you truly. I love my husband more than you. He gets so irate and so embarrassed, he banishes her. Okay? The remainder of King Lear is now, the, the other two daughters, abusing and emasculating their father. To the point he's stripped of all his knights, they're fighting about where he's going to stay, and ultimately he's chased, they want to take his life out into the storm-wracked field where he's half, half naked, and he's, he's delirious, and he's irate, and these two daughters are trying to kill him. Who should come to, to save him but his daughter Cordelia? His daughter who he banished, who went off and married the king of France, hearing that her father was in trouble, and her true love for him comes back to rescue him. And one of the most poignant moments in all of King Lear is their, their encounter one with the other. And this is where Cordelia sees her father for the first time after all this time and sees how terrible he looks, how badly he's been treated. She still loves him. She should be angry. She should be vengeful. She's not. She says, oh, look upon me, sir. Hold your hand in benediction over me. No, sir, you must not kneel. Her dad is kneeling before her. She wants his blessing. And he says, as you heard before, pray do not mock me. I'm a very foolish, fond old man, four score and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and know this man, yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is. All the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child, Cordelia. And Cordelia says, so I am, I am. And he says, and she starts to weep. And he says, be your tears wet? Yes, faith, I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. Because so, he feels so badly about the way he treated her and how badly he's been treated by his own daughters. I know you do not love me. For your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause not to love me. They have not. And Cordelia says, no cause, no cause. Now, I, again, this, all, this, this is a beautifully pointed moment in a terribly tragic play. So read it and feel very bad. But the long and the short of it is, is that in this very moment, Cordelia, what she does is she recognizes his dignity. It's not dad, what, it's not what you could, could have given me. It's not how you treat it because you're my dad. That's why I love you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I see King Lear every day in practice. I see King Lear as a CEO at a, at a successful company. He's now retired. And what he does is he comes in, he gets done with his work now that he's retired, and he goes home. And guess what? He's so busy that when he goes home, his wife, is, is she's successful in her own right, has done a number of things, has a life of her own. So she's not there. The kids, they've all been, they're wonderful kids, spread across the country. They're Ivy League educated. But they and the grandkids don't get home very much. Dad and mom have always been so very busy, and they've got their busy lives. So no one's really in this empty house. And so what he does is he goes back to his work. And while he's there, after about 10 or 15 minutes, and wants to kind of weigh in on things and give some advice and so on, everybody's like, you know, great to see you. We've got to get back to work. And you know, thinking to themselves, you know, this, he's not in control anymore. And he's kind of getting in the way. So what does he do? He comes and sees me. He's depressed. Who am I? Who am I in my family? Who am, I, who am I in my business? Who, I'm, and now I feel like I'm getting memory problems, or what have. And the point that we have, I mean, everybody wants to feel valuable. Well, I do. I want you to clap. But, but, <laughs> but the bottom line is, but the bottom line is, everybody wants to feel valuable. And, and, and interestingly, in the midst of everything we do in the healing profession, without being disingenuous, we might say something to them that is positive, that is the only positive thing they've heard today, this week, or this month. Unless you think that they pour their souls out about any number of things, you don't have a stake in this, you're wrong. Regardless of age or station, the dignity of the person before you is inviolable. And you don't give it to them by saying something nice or affirming something nice. You affirm their dignity. You recognize that which is sometimes beaten up in this efficient, technique-oriented, busy, distracted world. King Richard II is a wonder. If you, if you get a chance to read the histories, Richard II, Henry IV, Part One and Two, Henry V, extraordinary stories, and they're actually probably the most approachable. 
Richard II is not a very good king. He's, he's, uh, uh, melt. he's, he, he's mismanaged the, the trust of the people, taxing them for wars they're not, they're, not, they're not interested in, and he's kind of abused some of his own boards, and he finds that, he, that there's an invasion on his country, and he's about to lose power. And Richard II sits pathetically but deeply, deeply despairing, and he says, no matter where, of comfort, no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms, and epitaphs. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings. How some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping, killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king, keeps death his court. In every life there will be darkness. Every life. This is briefly, this is briefly, um, so we talked about Richard II. This is from Henry, Henry IV. So Henry IV is this guy sitting down, and his son, Prince Hal, who is the future Henry V, is a ne'er-do-well. He's hanging out with Falstaff. Falstaff, again, is one of the greatest comedy figures in all of Shakespearean literature, if not all literature. And he's hanging out, the prince is hanging out with this bad guy who drinks, cavorts, he does all sorts of bad things. And, the, and Henry IV is looking at his son and saying, you're pathetic, you're an embarrassment things that you've done. So Henry IV says to his son, an unrespected king, that's what you're going to be. When I die, you're going to be king. An unrespected king is but as the cuckoo is in June. Heard, but not regarded. Seen, but with such eyes as sick and blunted with community, afford no extraordinary gaze. You hang out with bad people. Lie down with dogs, rise up with fleas. Being with his presence glutted, you're, you're a glutton, gorged and full. And in that very line, Harry, that's you. For you've lost your princely privilege with vile participation. Not an eye is but weary of your common sight, except mine, which is desire to see you even more. These parents that get abused by their kids, we see this all the time. And you want to say, cut them off. Cut them off. And they're like, I can't. I love them so much. Which now does what I would not have it do. My eyes have blinded themselves with foolish tenderness. And then Prince Hal says to his father, this in the name of God I promise here. The which, if he be pleased, I shall perform. I do beseech your majesty may salve the long-grown wounds of my intemperance. I, I beg you that, this, that what I say will make all the wounds I cause you go away. And if not, the end of life cancels all bands. I will not be king. I will die 100,000 deaths if I ever break the smallest parcel of this vow. I will reform. I will reform, Dad. I will change. And he does. And King Henry the, or, or, or Prince Hal will ultimately become Henry V, which we'll talk about in a minute. Never underestimate the value of tough, honest advice, as Henry IV gives his son. Never grow cynical about people's ability to reform. You may be the sixth person, or seventh person, or the hundredth person, the twelfth person, the person to quit drinking, or to quit smoking, or to get their act together. And you may be the person that makes just that seed of difference in them. Don't give up on it. This is the same king who just kind of got upset with his son. He can't sleep. His kingdom is under attack. And he says, how many thousands of my poor subjects are at this hour of sleep? Oh, sleep, oh, gentle sleep. Nature's soft nurse, how have I frightened thee that thou no more will weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? Why rather sleep liest thou in smoky cribs? Here I am a king with everything around me, everything. i got somebody fanning me. They have grapes they put in my mouth. I open it wide enough. There's, there's things I can drink. And deep in my villages, the poorest of the poor have poorly ventilated, thatched, roofed sh shacks with fires inside. And smoke is building, hanging low. And there's a baby in a crib sleeping like a, like a baby. And I am a king, and I can't sleep. Can thou, O partial sleep, give your repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude? The boy who sits up in a crow's nest of a rocking mast of a boat, and he's up there, and it's wet, and it's rainy, and he's probably seasick, and he's sleeping. Can you give repose to that boy, and in the calmest and most stillest night, with all appliances and means to boot, deny it to a king? Then happy low lie down. Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. You guys have heard that one before. Heavy lies the head that wears a crown. Those who have responsibility and sometimes stare at the ceiling late at night thinking about this. Everyone worries. Everyone. Julius Caesar, Cassius is plotting with, with Brutus, and he says, about killing Caesar, men at some times are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars. It's not something out there. It's in ourselves, that we are underlings. 
Brutus and Caesar, what should be in that Caesar? Why should that name be sounded more than yours? As you remember, as you remember Cassius eggs on, manipulates Brutus, and ultimately Brutus stabs and kills Caesar. Um, and so in the process, you've got to be careful of your friends and your desires. But one of the most famous uh, scenes in all of Shakespeare is, is Hamlet looking at a skull. And if you actually think about what that means, it's a very, very poignant moment about the transience of life. Hamlet has just come back from, from being abroad, and he sees his grave digger digging, 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 throwing bones hither and yon. He doesn't realize that that grave is being dug for Hamlet's love, Ophelia, who's died, who's drowned in his absence. So Hamlet picks up this skull, and he's, he's, he's upset, saying, how can you treat these bodies with such disdain? Whose is this? And then the grave digger says, let's York. And Hamlet just gets, just like a bolt goes through. York was his gesture when he was a little boy. York was the, was the guy who took care of him, who loved him, a second father when his parents, the king and queen, were too busy. He says, alas, poor York, looking into his eyes, I, know, I knew him Horatio, his friend is saying, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He'd borne me on his back a thousand times. He gave him piggyback rides. And now how abhorred my imagination it is. My gorge rims at it. That's a Shakespearean way of saying, saying I need to throw up. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Your gorge is rimming at it. Here hung those lips that I have kissed. I know not how often. Where be your jibes now, the jester, your gambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar? Not one to mock your own grinning? To what base uses we may return ship? It's a moment of, of reminding us that life is short, not to miss what matters. And Othello, Iago, is, try, is conspiring to, to upend the success of the successful Othello, and he does it by sowing seeds of suspicion of Othello, of, of, of Othello about his love, Desdemona. And, and what, what Iago says is so true. He says the ability to sow seeds of, of suspicion is so easy for people. Trifles as light as air are to the jealous, confirmation strong as proofs of holy writ. We can just, I can just say the subtlest thing. Oh, I saw Desdemona. She was, she was with this one guy talking. I, do you know him? Subtle, the subtleties can, to the people who are jealous can become as confirming as proofs of holy writ. We can be irrational. We all are capable of being irrational. Almost done with these guys. As we talked about, as we talked about Henry IV and his near to well son, Prince Hal, Hal says, I will, I will reform. I will become better. <clears throat> Prince Hal would ultimately, his father would die. Prince Hal would reform. He becomes Henry V. And if you're all familiar, familiar with Henry V, Henry V is a story of the, of the English being insulted by the French and the English under Henry V invading France and going up to fight against the French at the Battle of Agincourt. Now, the Battle of Agincourt is a true battle. And there were thousands of Frenchmen who were well-equipped, well-rested, well-fed, and ready to fight. And by the time the British kind of got there, they were a ragtag group of sick and ill-equipped people. The odds were against them, several thousand. And so the night before the battle, what Henry V did is he got into a disguise and he walked amongst the camps and sat down and engaged in discussion with the soldiers to get the sense of what they were feeling. And he realized how much fear there was, how much uncertainty there was, how, how they believed in Henry V, but they hoped Henry knew what he was doing. And so armed with this information and knowing the responsibility he carried on his shoulders, the next morning he got astride his horse and he gave St. Crispin's Day speech that many of you have heard. He says, this day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand a tiptoe when that day is named. Think about that. Stand a little bit taller. And rouse in him the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. He will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's Day. Old men forget yet all shall be forgotten. But he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day, the pride of being part of an army that fought for something noble. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gloucester, be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. The story shall the good man teach his son. And Crispin Christian shall never go by from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother, be he never so vile. If you're the guy who collects rags and trash back home and I am the king, if you're fighting by my side, we are brothers here on forward. 
this day shall be this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now that those who stay behind sleeping that aren't fighting with us shall think themselves accursed that they were not here and hold their manhoods cheap while any speaks that fought with us upon St. Christmas Day. Now, as you guys maybe remember from the story, this ragtag group of British would go and beat the French, and it would be, a, it would be an overwhelming success against all odds. Now, just a little historical interest, Winston Churchill, when Lawrence Olivier, in this picture, that's Lawrence Olivier, one of the great Shakespearean actors, when, Lord, when Winston Churchill heard that this was going to be, in, during the war, that this, was going to, this story was being remade, he said, get that story out in early 1944. So he reached out to the director, he reached out to Lawrence Olivier, Everybody knows why. Why would you do that in 19, 1944? Guess what's coming? D-Day? What great story to tell. The story of Henry V, a ragtag bunch of ill-equipped, somewhat scared soldiers going against France with overwhelming might and winning. Everyone is hungry for purpose and inspiration. We are, our patients are. In Macbeth, as you might know, one of the bloodiest of, of Shakespeare's works, Macbeth is told by witches and manipulated, you will be king, you should be king. And when it doesn't seem to be happening prophetically, the long and the short of it is he takes matters into his own hand, he and his wife, kills the king, and it's a bloodbath the rest of the story. Now, Lady Macbeth, towards the end, starts to understand that some say understand, some say she just went crazy. But the long and the short of it is she starts to understand what it is that she did and starts to lose, lose her faculties. Macbeth, with his only ally, Lady Macbeth, going crazy, basically says to the physician, says to her primary doctor, me, or the cardiologist, canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Can you pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow? Can you raise out the rid troubles of the brain? Some sweet oblivious antidote. Cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart. Can't you get rid of all this pain? And the physician in that case says, therein the patient must minister to himself. This is a matter of conscience. This is not a matter of medicine. Science can now speak to the stuff of the soul as much as we might want it to. One of our last slides, as you like it, I love this one. The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Dostoevsky said the greatest of people are those who call themselves a fool once a month. Because if you don't call yourself a fool once a month, somebody else will. The key to all this stuff, you guys, and, and you know this, you guys are august, great practitioners, and you're deeply devoted to your patients. I have to remind myself this, humility. Humility about what I know about myself, what I know about my patients, and what they're going through at the end of the day. If the true vocation of medicine is to heal our patients, we must also seek to know them. And seriously, as we do this, we simultaneously begin to know ourselves. In this pursuit, William Shakespeare is an indispensable guide. There's one great story of a, of a uh, a very thoughtful individual who went to the school, I think in the Bronx, the Jesuit school. And Father Kennedy out of Boston with a deep, thick Boston accent loved Shakespeare. So he's teaching this gentleman who's telling the story. And uh, as, as Father Kennedy is, is telling the story, they're, telling, they're talking about Hamlet and talking about Shakespeare and so on. Mahoney in the class is the, is the class clown. He's jerking around and he's speaking with his thick accent. You know, why, you know, why, do, we gotta, why do we gotta know? I can't do the New York accent. So he basically says, why, why do we need to learn this? Why are you wasting my time? I'm, I'm going I'm to go. I'm going to be in some other field that's nothing to do with Shakespeare and so on. And the person telling the story said, Father Kennedy, with his clerical collar on, his shock of gray hair, and his face got feet red, the vein was pulsing in his head. He leveled a gaze at that Mahoney. And he said to him with his finger pointing him, and he says, with his thick boss and accent, Mahoney, when y'all read Shakespeare, Shakespeare's not on trial. You are. And I will say this. I remember walking away from Shakespeare when I was young, and I didn't get it. It was hard. There's a lot of writers that I put down that said, I don't get it. They're overrated. It's not for me. They're seeing something in it that I'm not, and I never will. But with humility, coming back to it years later, I was stunned at how much there was to learn, how much I could learn. And the fact is, literature is about the human experience. That's why it endures. That's why it's universal. That's why Dostoevsky and Austin and Dickens and Shakespeare and Dante and modern fiction. But the classics are a classic for a reason. They've just been retold in the modern era. We should read the originals. So I'll finish with this, a great quote from Jacques Barzin from Columbia. It's always time to stop repeating the wise sayings and begin to believe them. With that, I thank you for your attention. We are able to control the overhead mics in the back now, so the overhead
the mics are on, so feel free to ask any questions. You don't have to wait for me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, your interest in literature started when? You know, um, I, so I, thank you for recommending that, John. I, I, uh, my whole family is, was educators, and, and I was the only guy that ultimately went into medicine. And I did not know what it took to get into medicine. So I took every science class. I even took humanities that were geared towards sciences in undergrad. So I walked right past this stuff. And I always, I always say, you know, when I was in medical school, I bought all these books, and I put these books off to the side, and they were a reminder to me that someday I'll be able to read them again or read them for the first time. And so years have passed, and years have passed. And I've got to be honest with you, Shakespeare, I've been reading literature for a number of years. From a true reading of Dante and Jane Austen and so on, it's probably been the last 10 years. And, 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 and it's funny, this is a great quote, I think it was a Greek stoic named Heraclitus, that says, it says, when the boy approaches the river and steps in the river, and he comes back later and steps in it as a man, the river has changed and so has the boy. Right? It's, a, it's the same geographical river. It's the same human being. But it's different waters that are flowing. It's a different person stepping into it. And that's why, at the end of the day, you know, Shakespeare's not a child. I was. And I didn't understand him that great. So when I come back and read him later, I say, oh, genius stuff. It did the problem to the point of Barry Saul Morrison from, from Northwestern, what he was saying is so many people have, it's, literature's been destroyed because you need to read it in a political lens. You need to read it in a relevancy lens or this, there's symbolism everywhere, right? Oh my gosh. Not always. Not, not according to some of the authors. So I, I just, my whole point, and it's funny, I gotta tell you, at a fourth year gathering recently, this one student who was, was a fourth year medical student, the, the match day was the next day, he comes up to me, I give a little talk. He came up to me afterwards, I couldn't remember his name. Really nice guy. The only thing he said to me is, he was super excited. He says, Dr. Warner, I want to let you know, I read Hamlet. And, and I thought to him, and he said, I just bought my best. And I thought to myself, well, I, 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 first of all, I, I want him to be able to take care of diabetes and hypertension and all that kind of stuff too. But the bottom line is, his enthusiasm for re-exploring this stuff, just, it, was, it was wonderful. So that was like a two-paragraph answer, five-paragraph answer to us single question. Sorry about that, Todd. Todd, that, that was uh, fantastic. And uh, a comment and then a, a question for you. So, you know, when we are looking at our fellowship applicants, we are always, you know, it's, it's hard because we don't know, you know, we know some people that are, that are internal and, and stuff, but, but there's objective things that we can look at, right, when we're kind of trying to compare people and, and we can, you know, look at scores and papers and those sort of things. And I, I think that that may perpetuate, you know, uh, this process. And there's a lot of knowledge out there, as you alluded. But I want to get back to your initial slides, where the, you know, the uh, the emphasis on the the science, the organic chemistry. Has do you see medical education changing at all, apart from what you're doing for your students and the residents? Has there been any real change in the medical curriculum besides what you guys are doing? I think. Um, thanks, for that, Kevin. I think that um, it's starting to a little bit. You know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a great book um, it's called The Year of Our Lord, 1943. It's all about World War II, five intellectuals saying, how do we rebuild after this horror? You know, people who felt sway to communism, who felt sway to national socialism, who felt sway to utter materialism in the, the wake of the, the, the Great Depression, I mean, the fall of the stock market, the Great Depression, and so on. How do we rebuild as a civilization? And one of the things that he talked about was they, they, what they kind of all independently came to is we need to reclaim the human things, the permanent things, those things that, that unite us as human beings, our human experiences. Now, that might sound some soft or whatever, but the bottom line is we all know these things. We all know these, these, these deeper verities in, in life. But, but what he also said is, lamentably, from World War II forward, what we did really well in the war was we manufactured things really well. We learned about efficiencies. We learned about technique. And at the end of the day, I, here's the thing that I think that I most worry about modern medical, medical education. Um, it is so, sometimes it's focused so much on efficiency, on utilitarianism, on technique, that it loses track of finesse, loses track of intentionality, loses track of engagement, to the point where people, uh, is there, I, have no, I mean, to me it's not a real mystery why people are burned out. They're seeing so many people in so little time, and, and they can't give it to them as much. They're overwhelmed. And so, and so I, I think that... 
people are hungry for a vocation. They're hungry for calling. And if they spend a quarter of a million dollars in undergrad on top of their $250,000 upgrade, under, uh, a quarter million dollars in medical school, 300000 and $250,000, $200,000 in undergrad, and they come out and they spend X number of years in, in uh, fellowship or residency, um, there, there's so much pressure. Uh, and if they do that and they only get a job out of it, what a damn shame. And so part of what we, we try to do, I'll, I'll give you, I'll say one little brief thing. So Mike Cummings and I put together a paper on crafting a rotation for internal medicine residents that focuses not only on good medical practice, but on common sense and, and uh, reassessment of vocation. So, so all of this stuff, all this stuff, when Mike's coming here and giving his grand rounds, all that stuff, in addition to a great array of clinical bedside experience, and, and we've submitted it to JAMA for the medical education issue, and neither say they rejected it. And, and that doesn't mean it was a great paper, although I think it was. <laughs> but, but, the, but the bottom line is, it, then, you, then out comes the medical education issue, and you look at it, and all this is about, about we're burned out. We did another study and said people are burned out. And I'm like, guys, there's an answer for this. There's an answer for this in, in sort of re, revising common sense and reclaiming the culture of what it means to be a doctor, to be a healer. So I, so I do think that, I, I think strides are attempting to be made but at some point, people need to step back and say, in addition to being very good technicians, in addition to, to being capable of, of managing all this information and being wise utilizers of it, we need to be able to reinsert common sense, reinsert thoughtful heuristics, and reinsert the notion that this is a vocation, not just a job. And when that happens, I think the fire in people's bellies will be relit uh, in terms of being a clinician.